Okay. Good morning, everyone, and apologies for starting a bit late. Uh, as you can imagine, it's a big news day here in Delhi. So lots of pieces are still in the air. Uh, but I think this is a very important uh, topic and very important um, speaker we have today with us. Uh, we are looking uh, at, uh, we are uh, very grateful for Richard, uh, to Richard for, for coming here to, uh, this morning and uh, delivering this very interesting, uh, uh, initiating this very interesting conversation with us. Uh, technology and national security, a, a space, a debate that still remains uh, quite outside the purview of the traditional confines of national security uh, discussions. Uh, and and uh, understanding uh, what this century's technology environment looks like, how it interacts, uh, how it uh, uh, integrates with the larger debates on national security, something that I think all of us are coming, are trying to come to grips with uh, here uh, in, in other think tanks, uh, in some of our universities, uh, in, in some of our think spaces. Uh, because that's where the future discussion seems to be uh, traversing towards. Uh, in Richard, we have uh, a very uh, influential and a very important uh, member of, of fraternity who, is, who has started talking about these issues from, in a manner which, is, uh, which goes beyond the confines of academia, which, which sort of uh, uh, touch, touches upon the, the kind of debates that some of the policy uh, issues that emanate from this, uh, from this space uh, is in engendering. So here, uh, just let me very brief introduction of Richard, uh, senior advisor to the JHU's Johns Hopkins uh, Applied Physics Laboratory, a consultant to the Intelligence Advanced Research, Research Projects Activity, uh, and member of several others, advisory councils, advisory boards, uh, including the RAND Corporation, New American Security, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and so that I'll leave uh, you to read and then find out where, where he works and what, what, what all he does. Uh, but I think what we are more interested in is to hear from him uh, talk about uh, the technology tsunami challenges for Indian and American security, a topic that I think still remains um, uh, less understood uh, and very little talked about. So, Richard, the floor is all yours. Now, do you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. I think the uh, topic that I'm talking about is a very familiar one in one sense. We all have this sense of the technology tsunami as it's occurring, uh, but trying to understand it more particularly and analytically and then to tease out its implications, that's my aim over the course of the, the, this talk. I thought I'd begin with this quote from Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, who, as you know, is not a member of the American Defense Department establishment, um, but a German philosopher who reflected uh, that when uh, birds or other animals feel the change in the weather, they understand it intuitively, and it feels like a risk to them, like the hands of the enemy. And I think we think this way about the technology tsunami, but unlike the birds and the animals, we can have some ability to analyze what's happening. And as this tsunami-like effect, this is actually a picture from Fukushima, occurs, we begin to, I think, uh, need a better analytic understanding. Um, India, particularly, I have this uh, comment from uh, V. Siddhartha, is uh, defined itself in some respects as having particular technological achievements, notably recently in the cyber field. Uh, but your achievements in space and other ways suggest that you have the assets and the ability to come to grips with this. Um, the question is how to use them, the choice in that regard. I think all these choices are very much affected by not only the technology revolution, but something that will be a backdrop to it in what I will talk about, which is the changes in China. We all see the rise of Chinese economic power and the technological implications of that in terms of their ability to support basic research. Um, one measure of this is GDP. We all think GDP is a very imperfect measure, uh, lots of faults with it. But as a crude indicator, it's striking that uh, by most reckonings, the PRC will, People's Republic of China, will come to a point of equaling US GDP sometime over the next decade. What I think is even more striking is that the expectation is that by mid-century, Chinese GDP will be 50% greater than American GDP. The United States has not, in our lifetimes, ever confronted uh, an opponent whose GDP came close to equaling ours. The Soviet Union is about 40% of US GDP. 
the uh, Nazis were about a third of U.S. GDP. So uh, strategies that depend on being able to spend more money and get more technology superiority as a result become more questionable in the future environment. And that affects a lot of what we'll talk about. Um, I'd point out that none of the numbers, none of the predictions are certainties. Paul Samuelson, as good an economist as any of us know, more talented than uh, any likely present predictor of these things might be, in his textbooks published in the 1960s, predicted that the Soviet Union would have greater GDP than the United States by the end of the century. And he was wrong, but he kept repeating this in subsequent editions of his textbook. So take the numbers with a grain of salt, but recognize the, the particular thrust of the proposition here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I've identified what I think are 10 key characteristics of technologies. Uh, but I'm really only going to talk about the first six and just briefly mention the other four, because I want to allocate some time as well to talking about the implications. And I've given you a little list here of the, of the first six. Um, and I'm going to start with this notion of an autocatalytic uh, characteristic to technology today. And what I mean by that is that um, I borrowed the term from chemistry. An autocatalytic uh, reaction is one in which uh, the, all the components required for the reaction to keep uh, continuously operating are present already in the test tube or the vat. No external exogenous variable is required to affect them or generate them. And that uh, characteristic is, I think, fundamental to where we are, and it's really where I want to start. And as an example, um, I just plucked a press release, not particularly unusual unto itself, that came out this last summer, in which some people had developed a new technique for improving the ability to perform operations with a new technique in biology called CRISPR. CRISPR may be familiar to many of you. It's a means of gene editing. I don't need to get into the details at the moment. The new uh, technique said, if we create certain electrical impulses in the environment, it turns out we can do CRISPR much faster and better. And what interested me about this is not even the invention so much as what they said about it when they put out the press release. Because the new technique makes it possible to create viable T cells. In a little over a week, it's already transformed the research environment. Ideas for experiments previously deemed too difficult or expensive, now we can treat as ripe for investigation. Because we've made a technological improvement, which is itself a building block to other technological uh, improvements. Uh, we now will be able to work on 20 crazy ideas because we can create uh, CRISPR templates very rapidly. It liberates the system to move more quickly internally within the system that changes are producing other changes. Another manifestation of this is um, we now have these huge consortia able to work together across uh, boundaries, great distances, using modern connectivity and the like. And I just put down some of them. It's just a handful sample, Thousand Genomes Project, a Roadmap for the Epigenomics Project, Human Microbiome Project, International Cancer Genome Consortium. These are hundreds or thousands of uh, scientists collaborating with each other. So you see the force of the tsunami and what underlies it. I couldn't get recent data for publications, but the most recent accurate data I could get from 2012 had 2 million publications cited. Uh, that are appeared in 2012 uh, that were worthy of citation by others. In CRISPR, which I've already mentioned as an example, there was some fundamental work done at Berkeley in 2015. That work got picked up and improved in Beijing in 2017. And by 2019, further work was improved in MIT. So you get some sense of the power of what is happening. I've just so far used predominantly biological examples. I'll use some others in a moment. Now, a second phenomenon is exponential growth. And we all understand this. We've heard about it, et cetera. Moore's Law, Moore wrote this article, uh, Gordon Moore in 1965. He said, I can only see 30 years in the future, an amazing achievement, actually 20 years in the future, an amazing achievement. We'll have a doubling of semiconductor capacity capability at the same prices uh, every 18 months. And this doubling every 18 months, known as Moore's Law, is an exponential growth phenomenon. 
Exponential growth has been shown to be an attribute of other technologies, indeed a majority of these modern technologies. And we all have some hazy sense that that means very fast. And you may well be familiar, and may have come from India with the example we grew up with where the wise man asked by the king what he wants as a reward, says a grain of sand, a, a, just one kernel of grain on the first square of a chessboard, give me two on the second square, four on the third, eight on the fourth. And the king says this is trivial, but by the middle of the chessboard, the doubling is produced. All the grain in the kingdom belongs to the wise man. But this is, I think, also not a, a sufficiently powerful example of a phenomenon. So searching for a way to describe this better, I found one in this uh, well-known scientific periodical, Mother Jones. Uh, Mother Jones is a left-wing magazine in Boston. But somewhat improbably, this reporter, I thought, did a very good job. And what he said was, um, imagine I took Lake Michigan, this huge body of water in the United States, and I emptied it. And it's completely vacant and dry. And I said to you in 1940, I will give you one fluid ounce of water to pour into this lake bed. And 18 months later, I will give you two fluid ounces of water. And 18 months after that, I will give you four fluid ounces of water. What would your experience be like if you started in 1940 that way? By 1950, you'd have a gallon of water. You're pouring a gallon into this dry lake bed. You've been at it for 10 years. By 1960, you'd have 150 gallons. 1970, you'd have enough water to equal the swimming pool. 30 years of work and you have dumped the equivalent of only a swimming pool into Lake Michigan. By 2000, you have maybe a slight sheen of water on the lake floor. 2010, you have a few inches of water. And he makes the right observation then. What he says is, this is ridiculous. It's now been 70 years, and you still don't have enough water to float a goldfish. Surely this task is futile. But suddenly, you get to the knee in the curve. This doubling begins to take powerful effect. By 2020, you have about 40 feet of water in the lake. And by 2025, you're done. Hmm. After 70 years, you had nothing. 15 years later, the job was finished. So this is, I think, a very powerful illustration of what happens. Um, Watson Crick in 19, early 1950s uh, discovered the structure of DNA, and people think, now I'm going to have a biological revolution. It takes to our time before biology begins to pay off and you get the invention of things like CRISPR and the like. It's when you get to the point where that doubling effect becomes so powerful that the changes become so visible. And the run up up to then is largely invisible. It's like pouring water into Lake Michigan. This is a particularly powerful example because what this reporter very shrewdly did was he took 1940 as his base year. And that's basically the year of the invention of the computer. And one fluid ounce relative to the size of Lake Michigan is like one synapse in the brain relative to the size of the whole brain. And what he's saying is, it takes until about 2020 before you begin to have something approximating the brain power of the human brain, which is an unbelievable machine. By 2025, you begin to have fully that kind of capability. And roughly speaking, you can see that kind of thing in the computer revolution. And roughly speaking, we can see that kind of thing in all kinds of other revolutions, biology and the like. So we have this autocatalytic process, which is then exponential. The exponential impact, um, just to translate this metaphor into something concrete, here's a report that came out from Stanford just a month ago. Um, a group of people evaluating the progress in artificial intelligence. It's a very difficult thing to measure. And buried in the back of the report is this little graph. It's not a central point for them. It's just an incidental statistical observation. It's the amount of time it took to train a computer to recognize at an acceptable degree of accuracy an image, a dog or a cat, against a background of people and objects and so forth. And what they're saying is, if you look on the bottom, in, in June 8th, 2017, it took an hour. So that's roughly speaking a remarkable achievement. 
But if you look, on November 1st it took less, November 12th it took less, by November 13th, 2018, it took four minutes. That's exponential growth. So now suddenly a process that took 60 minutes takes four. And you can imagine the power that's unleashed from that, uh, from that example. As a common, uh, as another kind of example, just from everyday life, I uh, took this um, graph of uh, what's happened in terms of improving the accuracy of hurricane prediction, which is highly measurable. Where is it that the hurricane landed as against the prediction? And what you see is in this period from 1970 onward, here it comes again, the 65 year period, progression that's slow but steady, now to the point where the accuracy of our hurricane predictions is a multiple of what it was back before. And you see this every day in the weather reports. Now we complain when the weather report is inaccurate four days out or five days out. We've come to expect a level of accuracy that becomes a background fact in our lives. There are many other examples. I just want to move on to a third phenomenon, which is the small size of the devices that are produced technologically. Could have given the example of the computer, it's all very familiar to us. 1949, Popular Mechanics has an article in which they say the ENIAC, which is the big computer of the time, the, the powerful example, weighs, I don't recollect, something like 40 tons and has many 20,000 transistors. We can foresee a world in the future in which the computer will weigh only a ton and a half and have a thousand transistors in it. Um, and of course, for us, this is just makes you smile. They don't see how the far the miniaturization will go, that each of you have more computing power in your pocket at the moment than took the, uh, the first space flight to moon, uh, you know, had in the shuttle. This example is of a drone. I just want to give you a different kind of technology. You see that gloved hand of the US uh, soldier, and he's carrying in his hand a drone that is that big that he will then launch perhaps by throwing it, and it will fly for an hour and a half and broadcast back radio and, uh, and camera uh, information about where the opponent is and so forth. The small size then facilitates a lot in this field, and it links to the next point, which is one about numbers. Um, you have to have some sense of the numbers in the context of uh, the world. I'm glad you're laughing because I spent uh, $10 to get a license for this cartoon and nobody ever laughs at it. Um, so I'm, you can contribute a dollar after the talk if you don't mind. Um, the numbers show up in, for example, the lines of code, um, which are very important. Um, you have to have some sense of what's going on in the world here in terms of when people talk about vulnerability of computers. We tend to think there's one the rule of thumb in the industry is one bug, one vulnerability, one bug for every 1,000 lines of code. Windows 10 has 50 million lines of code. Google's operations have 2 billion lines of code. Nobody understands this, no single human being. It's not possible. Google has a large part of its operation devoted to understanding the code that some Google programmers are taking from other parts of the Google program. They call it technological debt. What you're borrowing from elsewhere that you really don't understand because you didn't develop it but has embedded within it other kinds of things. And this is because we're operating with such large numbers of things. Congressmen say to Facebook, you should be screening, uh, for example, your videos um, uh, to see what's going on. Well, as it turns out, there are 8 billion videos on Facebook each day. You have to understand the numbers to have some sense of what's going on here. Four million likes, four million likes every minute on Facebook. To give you some sense of the numbers, though, I want to give you a little question. Um, and it's a question you should have no reason to know the answer to. Um, I just want you to think what you guess the answer is. And the question is, how many transistors are manufactured each second worldwide? The transistor is the small logic device that powers your cell phone, your computer, et cetera. And it's invented in. Uh, strikingly um, in 1948. Um, it's a 60th anniversary is coming up, I think it's June 30th. Um, and it replaces the vacuum tubes that came before it. And it begins to be produced en masse as you go along. So you know that this is a substantial number. But I'm asking you how many are produced in that amount of time? 
how many were just produced. And I want you just to think what you think the number is. The, uh, when I started to try and calculate this number, I was so disoriented by it all that I have engaged the Intel Research Department to look at my results, Intel being a major manufacturer. And some friend of mine there got the work done, and they were disoriented. And we looked at the numbers together, and we spent an hour sorting them out in the conference call. The number we generated was generated five years ago. I've adjusted it now because in Moore's Law, it would have doubled two years later. And now the number I'm going to give you is already two years out of date, so I should probably double it. But putting all that aside, I'm going to take it on faith that you all have a number in your head. Yes? That is the number of transistors that were manufactured in that time. So when, for example, there's discussion about, well, we should screen transistors coming from China to see whether they have any defects, et cetera, you have to have some understanding of what the numbers are, which in turn powers systems. There are a, hundred, a billion transistors used in a major graphics program. NVIDIA, which is a leading producer of uh, the uh, chips that underlie the artificial intelligence revolution, has a chip out now that does 120 trillion computations per second. So grasp now how the autokinetic nature of the world, the, uh, the phenomenon of exponential growth, the small size of what we're dealing with is now linked as well to these extraordinarily large numbers. Fifth characteristic is that there's been a move from government-centered research to uh, commercial research. And this is a graph in the United States of uh, the spending uh, by government in the dark blue between essentially 1950 and 2010. And the red shows you the commercial. And you see how the red grows proportionately to ever greater numbers. And connected with this is the fact that these corporations and the like are globally diffuse. And this is very tied to international trade, which itself is undergoing exponential growth. I seem to have taken away my trade slide. Um, so uh, what we're seeing is a global diffusion of all these uh, kinds of things. And then um, sixth, I'm going to, uh, well, I'm sorry, connected to the uh, commercial uh, growth is an important change in the underlying dynamics of what we're doing. And to underscore this, I put up this wonderful picture of a 19th century uh, photographer. There's a book by Nicholas Negroponte called Being Digital, uh, published in the 1990s. Quite a good book. Uh, and he says in that book, if you look at photographers in the 19th century, when they wanted things, they went out and invented them. They developed their own cameras, better lenses. They developed their own film. They developed their better, uh, the improved techniques of developing film. They created what they needed. And Negroponte nicely says, now look at television. Nobody thinks that television was created by the actors. The actors had to adapt to the technology. The technology was not adapted to them. If you were an actor and appeared in the traditional way on the, on the stage and said, well, I don't care. I'm not interested in this new technology. I never asked for it. Your career became quickly overshadowed by the people who adapted to it. That's the fundamental problem. In the Pentagon and in the worlds in which I worked in it in the 1970s and 1980s, we were photographers. We commissioned the work on stealth, internet, uh, space satellites, semiconductors, etc., GPS. And they were all created for military purposes and then had substantial civilian uses. Now we're all television actors. The civilian enterprises are creating this, and we need to adapt to it in the national security world. The uh, speed of dissemination is another then striking characteristic uh, uh, of what's going on. And um, this first chart shows you something which is quite remarkable. Uh, it's the speed with which the uh, devices like the washing machine and the automobile became uh, spread through American life, diffused. And what's striking is that over a 120-year period, 130-year period from 1890 uh, to 2014, you get these sharp rates of increase, 
exponential lines of growth, if you will, of the dissemination or the proliferation of these devices once they reach their takeoff state. But what interests me is not this impressive as it is. It's what the 21st century looks like. So try and keep these lines in mind and how impressed we are by them. Here's the 21st century. Much steeper lines of ascent as we talk about the computer and the cell phone, et cetera. But even more strikingly, this is half the period. This is from 1950 to 2010. It's 60 years as compared with 120 years. We're seeing a rapid dissemination and global proliferation. And here's my trade slide. Um, this is manifested as well as international trade. The bottom of this graph is essentially 1947, where the line begins to ascend, uh, 1946, um, post-World War II. But nobody, I think, expected international trade to explode in these kinds of ways. And it's connected to this technological growth, the autokinetic character of it, the invention of the jet engine, et cetera. The uh, cargo container, is standardization of it is extraordinarily important. But then also, what you're getting is small sizes. So you can begin to do that. Those semiconductor chips can be shipped and are shipped worldwide to be assembled in different places and the like, partly because they're so infinitesimally small. Um, so uh, I could spend some time on some other points. I'm just going to mention them, because I want to get to some of the implications in this and then leave some time for discussion. There. Um, uh, a, a seventh uh, phenomenon is that we've rendered these devices often quite a bit easier to use by the end user than the complexity of them would suggest. We've hidden the complexity. And to hide the complexity means that uh, it's uh, your cell phone. You don't need to understand it to use it, although aspects of it may be challenging to understand. Um, the scientist who works with the new techniques of CRISPR or synthetic biology or sequencing can do things that previously required extraordinary effort in the laboratory and extraordinary skill. And now they can order DNA from a laboratory uh, from a shipper who will put together composite pieces of DNA and give you whatever genome you want. And they can use sequences and synthesizers that involve plugging in software programs that are vastly simpler to use. Among other things, among the other implications of this is that terrorists and other groups can begin to acquire national kinds of capabilities. Drones, for example, can be used by terrorists because they're so commercially available, the previously noted movement to the commercial side, and they're so simple to use. We can predict, generally, roughly speaking, the direction of this, but the timing and the pace is very hard to predict, and a lot of things will intrude from the sides. I want to emphasize, and I'll come back to this in the security context, that assimilation is frequently more difficult than development. Smart corporations spend more typically on trying to absorb the new devices than they do on developing, uh, figuring out how to use them, how to integrate them, and the like. And I would note, finally, that this, is a, this technology is a double-edged sword. It can be used in either offensive or defensive ways, for good or for evil. It's all the same. It's an instrument. It's a road you can travel down or a stick you can pick up to beat anything uh, in any direction. It's not intrinsically good or bad. So we could spend some time talking about the tactical implications of this. I'll just give you a quick example, and then I want to talk about the strategic implications, which are much more important to me in my concluding minutes. But tactically, let me just take an example like intelligence. Here's a cube satellite. A cube satellite is about uh, half the distance of this table, and uh, it's launched essentially free of charge, uh, very low V, as a part of other space launches, because it's so small you can just stuff it in the corners of shuttles and, and rockets, and then it's just launched by being uh, jettisoned from the, the vehicle. Um, if you ask yourself who's the largest launcher now of satellites, it's not China, Russia, et cetera. It's Planet Lab, a company in San Francisco that's launching these satellites. They have a constellation of 150 satellites. They are able, essentially, to cover every part of the world. And they sell the information. And the level of uh, digital precision that they can give you with regard to it is good enough that you could pick out the cars in the street uh, in front here. Um, so now, 
private entities can acquire information that a few years ago would have been the pride of any intelligence service. And everybody has their own space surveillance system. Now, it doesn't give you every minute everywhere, et cetera. It's got its limitations. But you get the thrust of the possibility. New technologies like quantum cryptology will change the nature of our ability to protect codes. You'll have to account for that. And most of people think that most of what is now secret will become subject to being cracked using quantum techniques. Individual operations uh, where I send a classic spy become much more questionable in a world where DNA is identified and associated with everybody. Uh, not to mention uh, other kinds of things very familiar to you, like uh, uh, tracing eyes and uh, using thumbprints. Biological sensors can change awareness of the environment, see whether people are doing nuclear testing or whether ships have been moving in a particular area. Artificial intelligence will change the way intelligence analysts operate. These are all tactical examples. I'm going to put them all aside. But I want you to just to see how evident it is that these professions must change. This is the intelligence profession. More broadly, though, I want to suggest um, strategically some important propositions. First. A lot of the Western intelligence and scientific establishment is built on the notion that surprise cannot be avoided, uh, uh, surprise can be avoided, that the aim of the effort is to avoid technological surprise. I've talked with a number of DARPA directors over the years, all of whom I count as friends and all of whom I think had a very sophisticated understanding of the world. Um, but they keep saying, because it was a mission of DARPA, our mission is to avoid technological surprise. This is the center enterprise in the Defense Department, Defense Advanced Research Projects activity. Um, and my view is, no. Given the speed of change, you're not likely to avoid surprise. Given the proliferation of scientific talent and the like, and the multiple kinds of uses, and the autokinetic sorry, autocatalytic aspect of this, you're not able, I think, to predict and expect that you can fence off everything. If technology changes once every 25 years, fundamentally, maybe I can avoid surprise. I can see it coming five years in the future. But if it changes every 18 months or three years, I have a much harder problem. It's a worthy goal, but recognize how you're going to fail and build resilience, et cetera. I've suggested a second consideration, which is you cannot spend your way to superiority, um, given the Chinese economics that I've described and the diffusion of scientists and science capability around the globe. More fundamentally still, um, what does it mean to build uh, capability in this world? Uh, every scientific innovation that we've had that's relevant to warfare has been copied sooner or later by other people. It diffuses. And this second order fast follower phenomenon is very important. But if, in fact, we're going to see fast followers following very quickly, and if assimilation is more important than development, everything I develop, other people will develop and be able to use. And the question will be, who can use it best? And this brings into question the whole operation that we're going through. And I'll come to some of the larger implications in a moment, but one question is, should you be content with being a fast follower? And given that you, surprise is inevitable, and you will have to follow in some areas, how do you improve your capacity to do that? So I've said several times, assimilation is a more critical differentiator than invention. And the classic example of this, I think, is German blitzkrieg. Uh, the Germans essentially harness a technological set of circumstances to their strategy. They recognize that the combustion engine and the radio change your ability to deploy troops. And from that, they get blitzkrieg. But the combustion engine and the radio are fully available to everybody. This is not some state secret. The French look at this, and they give you the Maginot Line. The Germans look at it, and they give you blitzkrieg. And that difference is fundamental, I think. People don't understand the implications of a technology and how to utilize it all that readily and instantly. And that failure to grasp the potential 
is fundamental to our national securities. Uh, India is the United States, China is everybody's. Another example of this is the drones, which I've touched on. Drones were around for a long time unmanned aeronautical vehicles. We didn't call them that, but in World War I, you'd send up a drone just as a target to be shot at so you could practice your aim. Nobody sees them as potential instruments of warfare till the Yom Kippur War and the Egyptians are shooting down all kinds of, uh, with all kinds of unexpected success, shooting down Israeli aircraft. And the Israelis are desperate, and one smart officer says, I've got an idea, let's send up our drones and this will distract the fire and enable us to better protect our aircraft. And he does it and it works. And so now people think, I could use these things in these other ways. A very smart Israeli says, I could use these for surveillance. I could send them up and get them loitering and the like uh, and see what's going on underneath. The Israelis, despite their innovative, uh, deserved reputation, are not very drawn to this. The guy emigrates to the United States. The US military is not very drawn to this. They fund some projects. Nothing goes anywhere until the US is involved in the war against Serbia. And uh, the Serbs use cruise missiles that are mobile. And they, uh, I mean, they, are, they move them, as uh, Saddam Hussein moves scuds uh, later. They move them from place to place. And the problem is, uh, how do you keep track of where they are? And a smart American officer says, we could use those drones. We could have them uh, loiter. So they begin to be used for surveillance. And nobody sees the potential further, at least so far as actually achieving it, until the search for bin Laden in Afghanistan in 2001, 2002. And then the people say, well, I could use the drones to find him. And they use the drones and they call in strikes, but the problem is the strike arrives a half hour later and he's gone. And a uh, smart Air Force officer says, I, what we ought to do is arm them so that we can fire remotely from the drone. Now suddenly you have a whole new form of warfare where there's a fundamental underlying change. But the technology, by and large, lay there well in advance of the actual uses. The tech improvements in the technologies of communication and firing and the like were essential to ultimately getting from World War I to the 21st century, but the fundamental strategic conceptions aren't obvious from the technology, and that's a big, big step. Moreover, that step is always accompanied by huge resistance from legacy interests. Enterprises that either as contractors have a financial interest or as professionals, this is what I grew up with, I'm really an expert, I'm a cavalryman, don't tell me in 2019 I can't keep at my horses. Uh, because for me, this is the essential identity of a warrior. I have uh, surface Navy ships or manned aircraft, don't tell me about unmanned aircraft or changes in my system because of surveillance. That resistance is very striking. And I want to give you a visual demonstration of it. Uh, there was a thing started, some of the research was done when I was US Navy Secretary. I'm very pleased with the way it developed. The US Navy produced an unmanned ship. Recently, uh, it launched it to Great Hoopla. We can send this ship thousands of miles without anybody on board. It can navigate itself. It's like a self-driving car kind of thing. And here was the ceremony in which the sailors line up at the, uh, on the ship. Uh, before launching it, et cetera. And I looked at this photograph and I called up the program manager and I said to him, am I right that this orange circular thing in the center left of this photograph is a life preserver? And he acknowledged that it was and I asked the obvious question, why do we have a life preserver on a ship with no people? And he said, well, we thought about that. Unfortunately, there's a Coast Guard regulation that requires a life preserver on every ship. And uh, he said, we tried to get the Coast Guard to waive it, but finally we figured it was just easier to hang up a life preserver. Um, so this is a visual representation of an absorption resistance from legacy regulation. Uh, I'd be a little surprised if it turned out that India didn't have analogous problems. Um, so you can see that the challenge strategically is to rethink the possibilities in light of what's happening. 
But to do so while traveling against the gravitational pull or the resistance of the existing system. A second major, or another major implication of this is in the personnel systems. Um, one consequence of the uh, problems of the, uh, of the speed of technology change is that policymakers become obsolete. Um, by that I mean they tend not to understand what they're dealing with any longer. If technology changes a process that occurs very slowly, over the course of my 25 year career when I progress from being an entry seaman to an admiral, or a soldier to a general. When I'm a general, by and large, I understand the technologies I'm dealing with. If I have a discussion, for example, of kinds I've participated in about sending a carrier somewhere or doing something by way of a strike, we basically, everybody understands what that involves. That's a common understanding of it. They grew up with it. If you have a cyber discussion, by and large, the people in the room haven't grown up with it, and many of them don't understand it. Mike Hayden, former director of the CIA, former head of the National Security Agency, which was the US imagery, writes in his memoirs that he would leave a meeting in the Oval Office or in the Situation Room in the White House, and if there were 10 people in that room and they approved a cyber strike, he felt like there were 10 different understandings of what they just approved. And this becomes crucial when you start talking about people who are leading the strategic change we're talking about, how they think about drones and the like. Uh, an equal problem is that the younger people who sometimes remarkably have these skills aren't valued for them and face career progression, which is constantly frustrating to them. So there's much discussion in the United States about how we lose people from the professional military into the cyber world, et cetera, in the private sector, because among other things, that pays them so much more money and so forth. But when you talk to these people, that's not the problem. It's relevant, but it's not the problem. The core problem is they're given huge responsibility in the uh, private sector, and they can run with it, and they can get promoted and make money and be satisfied professionally in that realm. And in the military, what they're told is, you're an expert in this. If you want to be promoted, you have to stop doing it and do more general traditional military things. You need to go to CE, et cetera. And so we lose these people and their goal. So at the top, we have this problem of the, uh, if you will, the inertia of the system. And at the bottom, we have this problem of the loss of these people who are extraordinary. Um, and I can tell you more about this if, if it interests you. Uh, we can talk in some more detail. I just want to flag one more uh, area of difficulty, which is fundamental, and then open this up to discussion. Um, you have to ask some larger questions about where we are and where we're going. And uh, I think of the Count of Monte Cristo as a kind of example in this, this Alexander Dumas novel. The Count is in uh, prison, and he works extraordinarily hard. And he digs and digs and digs with small devices so that he can get out of his prison cell. And 21 years later, he gets out and he emerges from his tunnel and he's in another prison cell. There is some of that sense I think I have about the technology battles. You just keep fighting them, trying to maintain dominance and superiority. And then we wind up in yet another cell fighting another battle about another weapon. So you have to ask some fundamental questions about our human behavior in this. And our fundamental questions are further enhanced by the fact that we lose control of these technologies. Let me take the nuclear technology as an example, because we have so much experience with it. Uh, as you know, it's developed through the early 1940s, and we get the first atomic explosions at the end of World War II. The scientists, the physicists who worked on these systems were remarkably smart. And they developed remarkable understanding of these systems. And they worked with them for years and years. And yet we still had serious accidents. We are not smarter than these people. And we do not understand our new technologies better than they understood their new technology. But we have things like Castle Bravo, a US nuclear test in 1954, in which the US uh, the, the, uh, they're testing a new trigger system, and they very carefully analyze how big the fallout is going to be, and they calculate it, and they conclude it will be X, 
And they say, but as a safety measure, we'll create a radius of 2x for evacuating people around the bomb. And they explode the bomb, and the radiation spreads three times as far as they expected. And as I recollect, 685 people are contaminated, and uh, islands have to be evacuated, et cetera, in the Marshall Islands. There's a website called Broken Arrows that recites some 34 nuclear, major nuclear accidents that have occurred over time. So what are the risks of accidents associated as we start working with the biology and with the uh, artificial intelligence and the automated systems and the drones and we continue working with the nuclear systems and we bring in all these new technologies? We know that what happens with new technologies is we have what are called emergent effects. Complexities are not so fully visible and uh, they emerge in the field in actual use. We account for that when we introduce something like uh, uh, self-driving cars. We will not allow self-driving cars into broad use in the commercial context until they've driven hundreds of millions of miles in all kinds of contexts. And we say simulations are good, et cetera, but we know from experience you need to be out there. And we know there will be accidents and there are, et cetera. We don't typically do that with military systems of the kind I'm now talking about, the new ones. They change too rapidly for us to be able to do that. They're too numerous. We can't test them really under combat situations. And they may be highly secret so that, in fact, one person may have a series of siloed special uh, weapons and some other component of the military may have another series, and they don't know about each other. And the user doesn't even know what he's going to get it's until the combat situation. So there's a whole set of problems associated with here, not to mention the interactive effects of an adversary who now wants to poison the system, disrupt it. So we have to think about norms and treaties, and is it possible to cushion these effects and limit them? And India, I think, is important in this regard. There are some areas where India is very much at the kind of forefront of its capabilities, and some areas where it's not. Um, Artificial intelligence has been much talked about in India as an area where India is not at the first uh, edge. Uh, China and the United States dominate the field. And then it are followed by some less powerful competitors, but still knowledgeable entities like Israel and Canada and the UK and Germany. Um, but India is not very present in that. India could do any of a number of different things in this regard could try and develop this capability in the military, it could develop it outside the military, et cetera. But one thing also it could do is play a traditional role in trying to cushion these effects, given the potential for China as an adversary, uh, particularly. And for that matter, these things could spread, for example, to Pakistan, et cetera. They will. I just would note that you can't really assess these risks. And I'd conclude by pointing to a nice comment of uh, uh, Nassim Nicholas Talab, the guy who invented the black swan, or maybe popularized <coughs> the black swan idea. He says, when you're playing Russian roulette, you can compute the odds. If there's one bullet in the barrel, my chances are five times out of six I win, and one out of six I'm dead. But at least I know what the odds are. In this instance, we don't know what the odds are. We cannot observe the barrel of and I wrote a, published a piece back in June called Technology Roulette, picking up this metaphor, in which uh, I took the general idea and tried to show why you can't compute these risks and uh, then what we need to do about it. But one of the things we need to do about it clearly is think about it analytically, which brings me back to, in conclusion, my beginning. This is an alteration of the weather in Nietzsche's metaphor that is something we feel. Hopefully, if we understand it better, we can understand its magnitude and then begin to think about its implications. And its implications are for the way we manage our militaries, the personnel system, the way we think about them strategically, what we invest in, how we think about our uh, strategies and tactics as, for example, the evolution of our uses of drones or the Germans' involvement of blitz Blitzkrieg. All those things need to change. But then in addition, we need to step out beyond the box and change very fundamentally the ways we think about military competitions as these systems grow in power and we have less and less power to control them. 
as we become more and more, uh, if you will, actors and not photographers, as we are pulled by the forces of technology change, without any serious, uh, without any kind of com comprehensive ability uh, to control those forces. So I'll stop there and open this up to questions. Uh, thank you. This is fascinating. And uh, before uh, I open this up for discussion, I, I would briefly, if you, uh, I would like you to respond to a, a, a question that I want to raise uh, you know, at, this, at this stage. I'm sure this, is, this will be a question that others will also raise. Uh, there has been a remarkable uh, shift in the kind of conversations uh, that are emerging in Washington around China in, in recent years, I would say. Uh, Trump has escalated that, but I think the conversations started emerging even during Obama administration's uh, last term. And this shift has largely to do with, uh, with, uh, with technology being at the, at the core of it. What is happening to the technology race, as you put it, between, uh, between US and China. And there is a, there is a sense that perhaps uh, there was an underestimation of China's ability in some ways uh, in the US. And therefore, now that China has moved far ahead, uh, perhaps this is a time to do something about, about the challenge. So can you comment on this discussion uh, as, as someone who comes from Washington uh, and who understands uh, the, the dynamic there, as well as the implications this binary will have on the larger technology relationships that are evolving in the world? Because uh, you, know, you talked about the, you know, if technology is going to be the determinant of the emerging balance of power, then uh, countries like India will be very carefully looking at what happens between America and China and how, how a country like India can position itself. So if you can briefly comment on, on this particular aspect before I open this up for the short sure. discussion. Um, well, I think there are very legitimate issues um, important to look at in the US-China relationship, uh, particularly and in the uh, technology aspects of it, most especially. Um, I and a group of colleagues from the Hopkins Applied Physics Lab published a paper in December called A Preface to Strategy in which we highlighted the points about GDP that I've made and ask how the US should respond. And if you're interested, you can find it on the web, uh, more uh, talking more extensively about this than, than I will right now. Um, my own view is that uh, you can avoid creating some dependencies and some kinds of errors that it's important to control. Um, for example, uh, the discussions about Huawei. It makes sense to me to talk about limiting the uh, centrality of a Chinese company to, our, uh, to a particular uh, technology system. Not because of the power of the technology. I'm not as taken with 5G as some extraordinary change in the landscape. But because the change in the landscape enables a new decision about who will be central. And uh, in that context, it's not that I have particularly strong feelings about Huawei as an individual company, but I feel in general that companies, uh, Chinese companies, are likely to do the, uh, the bidding of the government and to the extent your data and other things become accessible to the company, they become accessible to the government. So that's one part of it. Another part of it is I do think you can sensibly restrict investment in your startups, et cetera. Chinese have been very active in investing in US startups. Um, and I think you can control some technologies for a limited period of time. But having said that, I do not think that you can control most technologies most of the time. And I think openness with China and flow back and forth is desirable. Um, I'm very concerned about movements towards totalitarianism in China, um, but I also think that we are not at the point where we should be treating them as we treated the Soviet Union, as a just committed opponent. So my sense is it's right to push on these issues, and in a number of instances, I've given a couple, uh, to be restrictive, but it's in an atmosphere in general of encouraging trade and encouraging exchange between these two countries. And I'm a journalist by profession and I work with Asian Age. Uh, my question is, is it true that China has proposed a plan for a parallel Chinese control internet? Well, uh, 
I wouldn't put it that way, but China um, is a good example of the uncertainties associated with technologies and how they can be used in either direction. In 2000, I would have said China's ability to create the so-called Great Firewall and their own internet system uh, is very uh, low. But in fact, they have largely achieved that. They do control their internet. So that in itself creates, if you will, two internets because the Chinese billion plus population uh, is already such an important part of the world. And one reason why I don't want to see too much spreading of Chinese companies in some of these areas is because I would not like that model of the internet to apply to countries in Africa and so on. Um, but then in addition, um, there are a whole lot of choices, some of them very technical, as for example, how you enumerate, what system you use to enumerate domain names, et cetera, where the Chinese are making one set of choices and the outside world is making another. I don't think of it as the Chinese having announced a plan to create their own internet, so much as they're asserting that they can make their own governance choices and their own economic and political interests and their own economic and political weight creates a natural island within the larger system. And that concerns me. I would much rather see a universal, uh, more universalized uh, system. So I don't think of the Chinese as um, having designed a competing internet, but I do think of them as carving out a walled off area within it. Yeah, well, fiber optics connects the whole world. Uh, it's no surprise, it's, and it's good that it's in Africa. But for example, if, uh, if a poorer African country receives highly beneficial and enticing terms from Chinese companies or the Chinese government, we'll loan you this large amount of money for you to acquire our internet system and our fiber optic cable, et cetera, then that's very tempting. They sign up for that. And they wind up, in effect, being within the Chinese side of the island, uh, within the larger system. Right. Yeah, you've got it. I'm DC Pata. <coughs> Must thank you for a very enlightening address. I think uh, technology tsunami can do two things. It can help development and uh, global advancement in a positive way or it can add to the threat scenario of vulnerable national entities. Uh, we can live with the speed. If transistors are creating a problem of waste disposal, I don't know. But we can also live with any degree of competitiveness in business. But we have to be very specifically oriented to what is adding to the threat scenario. I feel, I don't know whether something in your talk brings it out, I think there's an issue of security orientation of technology experts. Otherwise, we'll see every technology possibly as a source of threat. We have to define what is adding to the threat in specific terms. And security people have some idea of what constitutes a security threat. Listening to your talk, I, I found, for instance, that uh, uh, between India and US, and we luckily have a near total convergence between India and US on issues of global security. And perhaps uh, a good concentration should be in how is it that uh, we, are, we are no more in conventional war, fair days, that individual without uniform is becoming a war machine. And technology and security people perhaps, I'm referring to the new terror that is growing, uh, I hope, but I'd like to be sure that uh, the exchange programs that we have in security between India and U.S., this kind of specific issues come up. Thank you. Well, you raise two different important points. One is the, tech, the exchange between our companies and technology experts and our governments, and the other is between India and the United States. On the first of the companies, it, it is a challenge. Um, there are many companies in the United States that work very well with our federal government and are sensitive to security concerns. But there are some that uh, quite notably refuse to do that. 
And uh, I regard that as regrettable. I think uh, you have to, you can't be agnostic about this. You have to be, to some degree, involved. There is a famous statement by the head of one of our large companies, a uh, global company, that um, he thinks the company should be like Switzerland. They should trade with everybody and share with everybody. Um, if you take the view that uh, there's a risk that these technologies will be abused, I don't think you can take so benign an attitude in the way that uh, the Swiss might have taken towards trading with Nazi Germany and with the United States. And I think these companies have obligations that we need to articulate better. But of course, it's very complicated. It's a global world now. Remember that trade slide. Large numbers of the companies in the S&P 500 uh, obtain large portions of their uh, income from other countries. And so there are all kinds of complexities here. Um, but I do want to see more uh, understanding of the security concern that you mentioned. And I would just add that there's a bigger kind of concern, which is that the incentives within the market are typically to produce the goods without worrying about the security. And we did that with cyber, for example. And the idea is, well, the security will come later. That idea has to change, because you wind up being vulnerable in all kinds of ways that we've just seen. It's not just in the national security arena. I mean, if you take, for example, plastics, plastics are a technological achievement. They don't exist in 1950, in the, essentially on the commercial market. By 1951, they begin to become commercialized. So we don't think when we introduce them about the environmental effects, and now we find that only 10% of our plastics are effectively recycled, another 10% are burned, and the other 80% wind up in our oceans and our landfills. There's not enough forethought about these things. I mentioned the speed with which all these things are developing. The problem in part is that the historical model of legislation catches up later. But if you're having growth at exponential rates, unfortunately, our legislative process isn't subject to Moore's law. The government of India and the government of the United States do not progress improving their efficiency and their speed, doubling it every 18 months, in case you haven't noticed. So this is, I think, an important thing. On India and the United States, I just would say that the, um, uh, I think the relationship uh, obviously, over the years, has gone hot and cold. There are innumerable dialogues which promise all kinds of improvement, which turn out to be more rhetorical than they are real. We don't have enough really meaningfully uh, meaningful cooperation. I think India's unusual position with respect to technology opportunity, recall the V. Siddhartha uh, uh, quote that I put up at the beginning of the talk, um, gives it an opportunity for collaborating on these technologies that I would like to see India and the United States improve on. The top graduates of the IITs essentially all go to the United States for some period of time. Then very admirably they come back here or equally admirably from my standpoint they stay in the United States. But there's, uh, there's a potential for recognition of the Indian contribution to technology development and for collaboration together between the countries that I think is really important. One of China's big advantages is its size. The number of people they will have who they can generate who have extraordinary technology expertise. The amount of data they will produce through their systems for artificial intelligence and other purposes. India offers that opportunity to the United States and to itself. And the United States and India together should take more advantage of it. It's one of the reasons I'm here. So my, myself, Dr. Sagachar, I'm an IITS officer in government of India. So one of the statement that stuck And do you think that your government is changing at exponential rates of speed? No, that's what my question was. <laughs> so one of the important uh, statement which I found out from the talk was that you said that assimilation is more critical differentiation than invention. So by that statement, I think we have to provide the necessary policy framework for such assimilation to allow. So let us take the example of CRISPR-Cas that you took uh, initially. So that is seen to have uh, unknown, uh, like you don't know what can happen with that technology by gene editing. You don't know uh, intelligence can be federal, gene can be federal to make more intelligent babies, that everything can be changed. So if you provide that policy framework for assimilation, for allowing that technologies to happen, how do you 
then balance these negative aspects of these technologies and all because you have to be differentiator uh, in the global security uh, scenario but there is also a scene to be uh, limiting those so that th they don't have any harmful or disastrous consequences for the society or for the uh, whole world in the whole yeah so i think you stated very well the problem um i suppose i'll just offer three quick propositions one is very important to involve the professionals themselves. Uh, we've had genetic engineering possibilities for a number of years. The biologists convened groups of people at Asilomar and other places and arrived at codes themselves of conduct. And they said, we understand these better than the government ever probably is likely to. Uh, we ought to come up with some self-policing mechanisms. But if we don't come up with some that are agreed to, then they will be imposed on us from the outside. So in the best world, the first thing you do is animate those professionals to take it seriously. We see that in a number of areas. For example, in artificial intelligence, uh, there are groups of people. One, for example, is OpenAI in, uh, uh, in California, Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford, et cetera, who are professionals in these fields trying to come to grips with these efforts. The second thing is, uh, from the government standpoint, uh, ultimately regulation is quite important, but we need to recognize the, the chilling effect of heavy-handed regulation and the possibility that you do more harm than good. Uh, so I think the government is wise to try and be uh, as flexible as possible and experiment, put ideas out for comment, and uh, be very tentative and incremental in the development of the regulatory aspect. Uh, we're seeing that now with regard to internet privacy. Uh, you didn't get it right away, but slowly over time, Europeans and others developed ideas on this, and now you're seeing a more robust debate in the United States and in India and so forth. The, um, the third thing is to build for resilience. Uh, in the example of CRISPR, whatever guidelines are uh, produced, um, they may be either too light, too tight, or too loose, but there's going to be a risk that, for example, something is genetically created that then is released and produces bad outcomes. Um, I'll just give you an example which I find remarkably under-discussed. The 1957 swine flu, uh, I'm sorry, I think I got the wrong year, but the, the swine flu um, that uh, came out, yeah, uh, the swine flu epidemic, global pandemic, uh, was found in one year to be, sorry, 76, thank you, uh, was found to be almost identical with the uh, flu epidemic of uh, some years previous. Its genetic components were found to be almost the same. And it's extremely unlikely that you would have something preserved in uh, nature without, uh, that is as uh, fragile and, uh, and uh, mutatable as a virus, without those kinds of changes. So it's a leading hypothesis that in one way or another, this was an, a global pandemic occurred as a result of the escape of a flu from a laboratory or something else. One theory is open air tests done in China designed to test a vaccine, uh, completely benign and, uh, and uh, but uh, the, the aerosol vaccine turned out to be more robust and escaped. So you get these kinds of accidents. That's an accident like uh, I, des I described Castle Bravo in the, uh, in the context of the nuclear thing. So one of the things that DARPA, which I mentioned earlier, did, which I very much applauded and supported, is try and develop a program that would uh, create a safe gene, they called it, where, uh, if, for, if for example, you were experimenting with a new genetic composition, you made the organism that resulted dependent on some uh, chemical or nutrient that wasn't available in nature. And now you took that, uh, and if it escaped, it would be unable to survive because it wasn't able to get this special thing that you had programmed into it. So you had built a resistance uh, that was resilient into the program and uh, not simply regulated it. So I want to see more of that. Um, thanks, Richard. Uh, my question was uh, around national sovereignty, because when I was listening to your talk, it seemed that 
uh, there was an underlying premise that national sovereignty is here to stay because there was a lot about how countries can build their own capabilities. Uh, but at the same time, there was a parallel trend about uh, things becoming technology development becoming more global. And as we know, as in this economy is essentially a global digital economy where data is flowing freely across borders. So if you were to put on, say, Gordon Moore's hat and to look 20 years into the future, <coughs> How important do you think national sovereignty will continue to be? Is it going to be a fundamental feature <coughs> that remains for all times to come? Or do you think the digital economy and the spread of technology is going to challenge that as well in some shape or form? Well, you, you performed a little sleight of hand there or where you uh, gave me a uh, tell me about 20 years in the future and then ask me about all time to come. Um, <laughs> I think national sovereignty will remain important over these 20 years. I put aside uh, all time to come. Um, but I think that it's clear that some problems have to be dealt with transnationally. Uh, climate change is the current vivid illustration of that. Um, we've done fairly well in imaginatively creating some mechanisms that are international, uh, for example, for internet governance. Uh, I'd like to see more of these kinds of things. If there is going to be work by biologists to agree on the rules limiting genetic engineering, they're going to have to be global. I can't allow a pandemic to occur in China or the United States without it affecting India. Um, so. We need international global assurance in that. And in effect, what will happen is I think states will have to give up some degree of their sovereignty on those particular items by agreement uh, as a result of that. Uh, the states, for example, that agree to allow themselves to be inspected uh, as a part of the nuclear nonproliferation regime did that. Um, so I, I see that area as an important one. How much we can nurture it and cause it to grow and what its consequences will be, I don't know. I believe the state sovereignty will remain very important for the next 20 years. I'd only note that if you asked me this question 20 years ago, I probably would have given the same answer, but I would not have expected the states to become as robust as they had been, for example, in regulating the internet. I wouldn't have thought, as I noted earlier, that China could do this. So there's a sort of tendency of the globalists to count the states out when, in fact, they wind up being stronger than you would think. Uh, I'm a retired admiral. Hello. <clears throat> and uh, I realize that uh, our species are doomed, according to what you said this morning. Well, the question is when? Yeah. Uh, but we were brought up in a system where we were taught that eventually the actual delivery of ordinance will decide the issue. And helping the commander give his orders to deliver ordinance was supported by a large core of officers who were involved in planning and placing your assets so that you got the first advantage, as you quite rightly said, in the delivery of ordinance. Two questions arise from this. One is, <clears throat> are you implying that the delivery of ordinance phase is over? That the artificial intelligence will so be effective that will entirely paralyze the opposing system into uh, incapacity. And secondly, this of course relates to actual hostilities. In the run up to hostilities, will countries make choices as they often will in the capitals of countries. They make choices about what are the probability of winning or losing. And will they, as a result of artificial intelligence superiority, start coming to the conclusion that war is infeasible? 
and thereby bring about the end of the delivery of ordinance in any case. So uh, I want to give you my views about these things, but I want first to recall to you the line in the slide about how the technology developments are not predictable, they're very difficult to predict. And we can say something about their direction, but we can't say very much confidently about their timing. So uh, you ask whether the age of ordinance delivery is over, and my answer is no. Uh, look, within the last 12 hours, we have an example of just such delivery of ordinance. Um, and we will continue to have examples. But the direction of change is away from that. Um, the rate at which it will occur and the degree to which it will occur universally, I cannot predict. Um, but for example, it used to be thought that the aim of warfare was to occupy your opponent's territory, seize their capital, and the like. Nobody really thinks that in competition between the United States and China, even if it were war, the Chinese seek to occupy Washington and rule the United States, or that the United States seeks that with China. This is an example of a set of ideas that no longer exist. And you could give literally scores of such examples. Um, in the uh, 500 AD, military power was about the number of people I could get to raise from my farms, et cetera, and come with their pikes to fight. And then the small invention of the spur converts everything into the power of the cavalry women and the horsemen. And we get a whole feudal society built around the knight. And it's a wholly different system of warfare. And the people who have the cavalry dominate, as for example, at the bottom of Battle of Hastings. And the people who don't, don't. And it, you get these kind of constant changes. The long bow, I'm sorry, the long bow is a better example for the Battle of Hastings. You get these constant changes where you get a pivotal moment in technology. And I think as we get the acceleration that I've described technologically, the old instruments become less frequently used, less powerfully relevant. And I think that's, uh, that's where we are. Then people say, well, as you just nicely described, have we done away with warfare and the like? And I'm unfortunately very skeptical about that. Um, a lot of people, some people wrote that on the eve of World War I. There are some famous treatises about war is now unthinkable. And then we got World War I. So I don't think we can invest too much confidence in our ideas or our sense of where these things are going. Many of our predictions, including mine, will be wrong. The old will continue to live alongside the, the new. There's a famous science fiction statement um, about the, to the effect that the, uh, uh, the future has already arrived. It's just not evenly distributed. It's here. It's here in some places, but not in some others. And the past will continue to survive in those places. I'm afraid I see the possibilities for warfare as continuing. I'm not, though, despite the early uh, exchange we had uh, of the view that the species is doomed. I think it's just highly uncertain. And it depends a lot on whether what we do. We've got to be, I think, photographers more, controlling this technology more, and less actors being driven by it. And how we do that is very important. Yeah, no, I just wanted to make a very brief comment in relation to China. Um, because of Chinese history and so on and so forth, and, uh, which you know about. Well, the Chinese view the, um, and, and this business about ordnance delivery, what the Chinese view is that they are preventing through their internet control uh, the delivery of foreign cultural ordnance. Nice That's talk. really what it is that they're trying to do because that is what they're afraid of. They're not afraid of what you yourself said just now, of things which go and bombs going off. That, that's not what they're afraid of at all. So they view this thing as the delivery of cultural ordinance, and the mechanism of delivery is what they're trying to control because the content is not what they can control at its origins. I think that's a very apt comment. Thank you for it. Thank you, Dr. Richard. This is Monsi Abraham. What are your thoughts on creating a wall garden for India? I mean, like if you look at the future and look at, you know, technologies like AI and the need for large data sets and you have, you know, uh, 
some companies and some uh, you know countries which already have a dominance in terms of you know some of the basic things which have already happened which gives them huge access so you know if we have a wall garden do or do we i mean like you know kind of just cut off the innovation you know again for the you know younger players which can come up the next 15 20 years does it how does it impact the defense part of it uh, you know i would have to know, know your thoughts uh, regarding this So are you asking how we control substrate groups? No, what what's your take on this? I mean like you know is a wall garden good uh, a good idea for a country like India when we look you know 15 20 years ahead in the future uh, both implications industry as well as defense. That is how much we ought to invest on the industrial side as against the defense side? Yeah. So right. just just the basic regulation part of it where yeah. we try to create our own domestic players and right. again some people will have advantage right. but if you look 15 20 years into the future we'll find that you know uh, Yep. new innovation will get strangled at some point defense will might have a different strategy uh, industry might you know uh, right. things might happen differently but what's your take on it i mean like you know is it a good idea bad idea what, how do you how do you look at it well i'm uh i'm impressed with an indian decision many years ago to construct the is it 31 iits that that you have that's an investment in uh the nourishment of your technology technology ecosystem that can be go in any number of directions uh i'm delighted to see the evolution of more private universities in in india that begin to open up further opportunities for education outside the traditional mode i'm less uh taken with ideas of trying to pick industrial winners or losers or emphasize some particular technology I'm also not taken with ideas that say well we can alloc- develop a military technology which has got um uh, which is divorced from the civilian world. I've tried to point out the connections with the civilian world. So if I were the government of India faced with these choices, I would be investing I think heavily in trying to nourish the underlying infrastructure that generates the ecosystems of achievement like my educational system. and i would be trying to through investment policy and tax policy and other means try and encourage the commercial sector and then i would get the benefits of those downstream in the military sector rather than attempt to force them dominantly into the military sector to begin with uh is that responsive Okay, but in terms of you know just controlling the data where it where it stays where it goes oh, data, you, you spoke right. about free trade you spoke about agreements but um, then again some players are going to have an advantage right. so how do we i mean like you know uh, get prepared in such a you know a- area where you know we can develop our te- uh, you know our talents our technologies again with a view uh, when 15 20 years down the line we are not compromising still we might still have some time but you know if we if we miss that time yeah. and we don't put things in place uh, you know we'll be yeah. no way well uh i emphasize the human part of it because i think that's actually more important than the data control um the, the data arguments are quite obviously complex and uh have a, a number of aspects to them i start myself with a philosophic predisposition the notion that individuals should be able to control their own data and uh the government regulatory aspect ought to start in my view from that premise as well you then get into a whole lot of questions about corporations and allocations and stationing abroad and the like it's probably not useful for me to try and open up that debate at the end of this discussion but i think you can see where i'm coming from Thank you sir. Uh, so my question uh, first is a comment and second is a question and flows from it. You said that the law does not operate I- I'm a student of law at the University of Delhi. You said that law does not operate at moves law speed right. Any sensible jurist or student of law would tell you that law is best serving times 10 or 15 years before it was you know legislated on. So so in so far as that is concerned and the disruption in technology is concerned I ask you very simply so is law irrelevant is it obsolete and completely not taken into account when technological systems and innovations go into picture and the second thing you spoke about climate change being a reality for all of us but the engines which have shaped this climate reality today have not been that universal the emissions etc is what i'm trying to come 
And so we've seen with international law, for example, the nuclear domain. Today you see the Outer Space Treaty and all of those domains are mostly constructed, the legal infrastructure is mostly constructed by the first movers, the second, the third, and possibly the top five, ten countries. And it's for the rest of the world to take the burden of the space debris or whatever else that will follow from those outcomes which you mentioned that we do not think about or are not able to foresee at the moment. So if our legal infrastructure at the moment is so weak, don't you see that law in terms of you know the evolution of technology stands completely negated and at some level is appreciated to be irrelevant. Thank you. Well, it's a very important question, so nicely put. Um, I take it the bottom line of the question is, should you go back to school this afternoon? <laughs> um, my own feeling is that uh, law is fundamentally important. Maybe I'm biased as a law professor, but it's pretty clear to me that the legal mechanisms, both within countries and across countries, are what we have to try and control all of these technologies, and that the control is an extremely important question. Um, the law, I think, in these contexts, though, may take on wholly new areas of operation. For example, in the artificial intelligence, maybe not so much the regulation, ultimately, on the operation of the machines as it will be in the regulation of the human beings and how they write the algorithms, how aware they may be of biases, how much we require those things to be visible of the choices that are being made what constraints are written into the machine. Or in the genetic example, the requirement that they have the safe gene attributes so that if it escapes into the wild, it will not be fatal in its consequences. Those are different kinds of ways of thinking of the law than we have traditionally thought. They're not about damages, and they're not about criminal penalties and the like. Uh, so I think that's, that's just important. And it implies an answer to your second question, which is, uh, my concern, my desire with respect to law schools and for that matter technological institutions would be that they have more interaction with one another now so that um, the law schools perhaps spend a little less time talking about the law of perpetuities and property rights and uh, stemming from medieval systems of uh, control and uh, title and talked more about the present technological issues and lawyers and law professors and legislators better understood those technologies. And conversely, that the technology people better understood that they were involved with making social choices and raising issues that were fundamental. This is probably a good note to conclude on because when you think about it, it is really my theme in this whole talk. What I'm trying to do is increase your understanding, many of you not technologists, about what these technologies involve, so that you don't think, well, we should examine every transistor that comes from China. And conversely, for those of you who are technologists here, IT experts, et cetera, that you think more about, perhaps more, about the uh, political and uh, social and military and national security consequences of the things that are being developed precisely because you cannot say, well, I'll just produce the thing and let other people worry about security, for example, because then the security question can't be fixed any longer because of the architecture of what you help to design. Or because as technologists, you become like the Count of Monte Cristo, dig your way for 21 years and wind up in another cell. So we need more discussion between the two parts for this to be fruitful. And what I've done today is try and contribute to that discussion. Thank you, Richard. On that note, let me um, once again please join me. Thank you, Richard.